Good evening. It's good to see each and every one of you here on this Thursday evening of revival. And I trust you've come expecting God. That's what we want. We want him to come in this service and just have his way. Whatever he wants, that's what we, we want. And we're glad that you've come, come and join us, joined us here tonight. I'm going to ask if you would, let's stand together as we open this service with a word of prayer. It's good to have the Masons here. I'm not sure if they're here to join us or to keep an eye on their son, but it's good to have them here. I'm going to ask Brother Mason if he'd open this, this service for us tonight. Father, we thank you for this day you've given to us. We thank you for the privilege of serving you. We thank you that we're able to be out in this service tonight. We ask that you would bless the service with your uh, blessing. You may we feel your spirit. Help us to be obedient to to you and your word. We pray that you would just bless this service and what you do for us. We'll thank you and praise you. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing. Let's grab a songbook and worship together as Brother Brian comes to lead us tonight. Let's take the white chorus book this evening and start with number 42. As we open this service, we'll continue to invite the Lord's, Lord's presence with us this evening. We need him. Scripture says of the the workman, the workman, uh, now, I, now I'm losing it. He labors in, give me a second, unless the Lord build the house. They build it labor in vain, and um, if we don't invite the presence of the Lord with us this evening, we have met in vain. And so we want to uh, invite his presence with us this evening and ask that he would work among us. Let's sing number 42, Come Holy Spirit. with me as we turn over to number 48 number 48 in the course book there's something about that name now so thankful we can trust in that this evening let's sing number 48 together
26. Number 26. Someone so wonderful and so power uh, that can calm the storms in our lives and meet our every need. It is only fitting that we would desire more of Him. And He desires that we would desire more of Him. And uh, when we seek Him, He will be found. So thankful for that promise this evening. Let's sing number 26 together, more of you. Number 617, number 617, another song desiring that we would uh, have more of the Lord and be drawn ever closer to Him. Let's sing this hymn together, 617, A Closer Walk With Thee.
475. Number 475. And that's kind of the beauty of revival, no matter how close we are to the Lord, uh, He allows us to draw ever closer to Him. And how well we know the Lord and uh, how deep our relationship is with Him or our depth of knowledge, there's always a little bit more. We can know Him a little better and our relationship can be deepened even more uh, because there is, there is no measuring to the greatness of God or the depth that we can know Him. And uh, I believe this is our desire, each one of us that have met uh, through this revival and this second night, that we would go deeper and deeper in the love of Jesus. Let's sing this together, number 475, Deeper, Deeper. Of that second verse, deeper, deeper, blessed Holy Spirit, take me deeper still till my life is wholly lost in Jesus and his perfect will. What a place to be. Lord, help us to grow deeper and deeper in him and be lost in him and in his perfect will. Anybody with a praise or a testimony on your heart tonight? You wanna... The song really resonated with me tonight, and I was looking at verse number three of um, this song before the one we just sang. It says, Strong are the foes that conquer I must. Long is the way, but in thee I trust. In my own strength, the weakness I see. Grant me a closer walk with thee. God has been talking to me a lot lately about John chapter 15, where Jesus talks about abiding in the vine and how he says, without me, you can do nothing. And he's been showing me that I don't even just need him daily. I need him moment by moment. 
and I'm so thankful that he wants to walk with me. He wants to be my friend, and he's just been so close to me, teaching me and growing me in ways that has just absolutely astounded me, and it is so beautiful just to walk with him. I love him with all my heart. Amen. Amen. Anyone else tonight? All right. Well, we do want to look to the Lord in prayer. And I'm going to ask Brother McDowell if he'd make his way to the platform and prepare to lead us. But a couple things that we want to continue to remember. We want to continue to remember those that have lost loved ones. We want to remember the Stolzfus family and the Plank family. And the Lord knows their needs and he knows exactly how to meet their need and to comfort them and strengthen them through this time. So let's remember them in prayer. Let's continue to remember Sister Kaufman and Patty, Katie, Brother Webb. All those struggling with, with physical needs, and uh, let's continue to remember them. Let's continue to remember um, Kayla. She hurt her ankle, and we knew that Sunday, but it seems like she's torn her Achilles tendon, and they're going to have to do surgery. And so she's got surgery coming up and a road of recovery from that. So let's remember her specifically. Let's remember Elizabeth Habecker not feeling well, um, been sick today. And uh, let, let's, just, let's just pray for her especially. Let's continue to remember these services. We thank the Lord for how he came last night and, and met among us and challenged our hearts, but we want him every night. We want his presence to move among us. And I trust that you're praying. And uh, let's, let's just continue to pray for the revival services for Brother Mason and his family as they would minister to us and trusting God to continue to meet with us. Would anyone here tonight just have a request that you want to mention before we go to the Lord in prayer? Sure, we all have unspoken, signified by upraised hand. I'm thankful that God knows the need, and we don't have to mention it to anybody. It can be something that's near and dear to our heart, and we serve a God that knows and cares, and we can approach him and know that he's working on our behalf. I'm going to ask if you would, let's stand together tonight, and let's all pray out together and trust in God to hear and answer prayer tonight. Father, we thank you tonight because you are a good God. You are an awesome God. As, as we heard last night, a uh, God of, that is the creator of the whole universe, including us, and the God who is ruler over all, the sovereign God, the almighty God, we thank you and praise you. You are worthy of all praise. You are worthy of, of our, our allegiance and our uh, love and our service and we thank you that you are such a great and glorious God we thank you Lord that being so high and lofty and inhabiting eternity you still are very much interested in and concerned about us involved in in this world that you have made again brother Mason mentioned that last night you're not a God afar, a God afar off. You are a very present God and in fact a very present help in time of need who invites us to come boldly to your throne of grace to find mercy and obtain or to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And Lord, we have heard a number of needs tonight. We are aware of others uh, that we individually uh, know about and are concerned about. But Lord, we do ask that you would undertake for these that have been mentioned, and as collectively we bring them to you, even if uh, no one of us may remember every single one, you know them, and we t get join together and bring them to you. You know the ones who are uh, suffering from illness or pain. Just now we think of Kayla and, and a worse uh, situation than she no doubt thought at first. We pray as she faces surgery that you would help it to be successful and give uh, as good and rapid recovery as possible. We pray you would remember Elizabeth Habecker and her family, her parents, who would love to be here tonight, but she has been sick through the day. And I ask you would be near to them and encourage and help and meet the needs. I pray you would undertake for, for our uh, ones who are not able to get out on a regular basis, some completely shut in and others that uh, because of health and sometimes age or other situations are not able to come regularly. We pray you would be with the Susans, pray you'd be with uh, 
Brother and Sister Bob, we pray that you would be with uh, the uh, Pat uh, Waymans and others, uh, Brother West especially, or uh, Webb, would you be very near to him in a very difficult time of his life. I pray for my mother-in-law, be near to her. Thank you for the help you've given, continue to help. And then, Lord, we think of those who have suffered loss in, in just this calendar year. Uh, some that, uh, as time goes on, we, we tend to forget, but it's still very real to them. I think of uh, Brother Cooley, I think of, of uh, Brother Stroop, I think of uh, Linda, uh, and a little farther back, Mary these who have lost loved ones. I pray for the Oberholzer family, and I'm sure we could go just a little farther out and have many, many more that uh, would be connected in one way or the other. Brother Wilson mentioned somebody just uh, this past Sunday, I believe, or recently. Be near to all of them. And then, Lord, we do come to this uh, month of outreach and this uh, week of revival. Acknowledge how much your help is needed that Again, as we heard last night, it is through prayer, but that prayer is calling upon you and your power. And the verse that uh, Elizabeth referred to that said, in ourselves, there's only weakness. And so we do look to you. We need your help. We call upon you. And we thank you for your faithfulness. Give anointing to the Masons as they sing. Brother Mason, as he speaks tonight, help our pastoral leadership and us together as a congregation. Lord, you have a job for us to do. Please do continue molding us into uh, the body of Christ, the local body of Christ that will be able to accomplish the job that our head has for us. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.
another empty vessel fill with Lord another time and I am hungry for another wave of glory it's the fresh touch you have promised could be mine and I pull my chair up to your table Lord I'm ready now to dine here's another empty vessel fill it Lord another time here's another empty vessel Is that the prayer of your heart tonight? That's the prayer of my heart. We need another fresh touch. We need him, and we want him, and I trust that's the prayer of your heart. Why don't you turn in the chorus book to page number 40, or to chorus number 40, Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. Why don't we sing this as a prayer tonight? You know, worship is something we all participate in, and a beautiful song they sang. And uh, we can certainly worship and echo the sentiments of that song. But why don't we sing this song as our prayer, saying, Lord, that's what we want. We want the Spirit to fall fresh on us. We're empty vessels. We're here with our cups turned right side up so God can come and fill us. Amen? Amen. Let's sing this chorus number 40 in the white chorus book. Spirit of the we go forward that we would just let him come and afresh and new in our hearts and in our lives. The ushers are coming at this time to take up the offering tonight. We thank you for your faithfulness in giving and trusting God to continue to help us as we continue to do our best to go out in the community and be a light for him. I'm going to ask if Justin wouldn't mind praying for the offering tonight and you just give as God would direct you to give tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for all the blessings you give us. Um, now, during this offering, it is our turn to bless you. Help us um, in our giving. Help us to be joyful. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.
Thank you for your giving. Thank you for that offertory tonight. It's good to have each one of you here, and we have several visitors that are here, and we invite all of you back for the services start again tomorrow, and then Saturday at 7.30 p.m., and then we'll have our regularly scheduled services on Sunday. Looking forward to those services and trusting God to help us. We do want to mention that the prayer rooms are open before the services. They'll be open an hour before every service, and you are welcome, and I encourage you to use those. And uh, they're marked downstairs, and so if you're able to come, I recognize not everybody is. You can pray at home, you can pray on your way here, but if you're able to make it early, we would love to have you here and have a time of prayer. And so those prayer rooms will be open downstairs before service, and I would encourage you to use them. Tomorrow night is our Youth Emphasis Night. We're looking forward to that service. Trust you've been inviting. And if you know any youth, and if you are youth, we want you to come back tomorrow night for that service after the service. And uh, all that is done, that's most important. Whatever God wants, we want him to do that tomorrow night. But after that, we are planning to have a snack for the, the youth and uh, planning some games, and, and uh, I'm not sure what all else. I think we're planning a bonfire, and uh, it's going to be cold, so we're going to need lots of wood. But uh, that's what we're planning for and uh, looking forward to that. And so if you're a young person, college or high school, in those ages of youth, we'd like to have you stay and uh, be a part of those activities afterwards. And then this Sunday is Re Re Revival. We're having the services, but it's also Friends Sunday. We're in the middle of Outreach Month, and uh, hopefully all of you have friends and have been invited, and we're looking forward to a good service there. And then next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and uh, we're going to have a special Easter service Sunday morning. Church choir is going to be singing and uh, some other things going on there. We're looking forward to that as we celebrate our risen Savior. We'll be having communion in the evening that Sunday. Looking forward to those services and uh, trust you'll be able to make it to them. This time the Masons are coming to sing for us once again tonight. And then he's going to preach for us. Tremendous challenge to us last night. And uh, they've been, the songs have been good and uh, good messages speaking to us. And we're trusting God to continue to help tonight. And so let's continue to worship as they sing. Let's pray for him as he preaches. And uh, let's pray that God would speak to us again tonight and come and help us as we do our best to grow spiritually and draw closer to him. Let's keep our cups right side up that he can come and fill us. Masons, would you sing for us? I want Jesus in my life More than anything this world can offer me For I know that He alone can satisfy Just to know Leading in my life is worth anything that I might sacrifice. Oh, I want Jesus more than anything. Take the thing that I might want and all the things that seem so dear, I'd rather have Him than any praise that man may give to me. I want Him to have control and be the breath of life in me. I'd rather have Jesus, I'd rather have Him than anything. He has power without end, and from the heavens He ruled the universe. Countless angels waited on his every call. But that day I saw him all alone, 
On the road to death and untold agony Just for me he suffered What a price he paid Take the thing that I might want And all the things that seem so dear I'd rather have Jesus than any praise that men may give to me. And I want Him to have control and be the breath of life in me. I'd rather have Jesus I'd rather have him than anything. As I go on through life with him, well, there could be no other way. I want Jesus more. Well, I trust that's your prayer tonight. Do you want him more than anything else? More than anything else that this world could offer. Well, this revival is what Brother McMillan wants, a missions revival. By the way, I like that just a little bit. I think it's a good thing. And honestly, if I'm to be frank, I think more churches ought to do it. Maybe it'll catch on. Um, because missions is important. Last night, we talked about what I called the fuel for missions, both at home and abroad. And I know <clears throat> these terms are somewhat relative. But tonight, if last night was the fuel, tonight I believe that I would like to speak on what I would think is the engine. Tomorrow night, Lord willing, we'll speak on the vehicle. <laughs> Lord willing, on Saturday night, we'll speak on the purpose. And then we'll save it for a surprise for Sunday morning and Sunday night. I know what I'm speaking on. But the fuel last night and the engine tonight, I don't know, maybe we have these backwards. Maybe all the theologians sitting in the congregation would say, Brother Mason, you have this messed up. But that's all right. It's us preaching, so we'll just have it messed up, okay? Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. We're going to stand together in honor of the reading of God's Word, if you can. If you're not able, that's fine. I understand that. 2 Kings chapter 2. I probably shouldn't tell you this, especially with Brother McDowell sitting here, um, but uh, I think I'm about to do something I've never done before. I, I almost, I thought about doing this. I, I thought I had this message in English, and I searched and searched and searched, and I don't think I've ever preached it in English, to be honest, and uh, I almost preached it from Spanish and English, but I decided not to do that. That was a good thing. And, uh, but we are going to preach this sermon for the first time ever, I'm pretty sure, in English. And I, I shouldn't tell you this, but I am. Um, so if there are a few things that sound a little goofy, just chop it up to Spanglish, okay? So we'll have an excuse. 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind 
that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal, and Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou not that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yeah, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto them, Elisha, tarry here. I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho, and the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou not that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered and said, Yes, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. And they too stood by the Jordan. That's Elijah and Elisha, the two of them. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over. But Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken away from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two places. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither and Elisha went over. When the sons of the prophets which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. I'd like to ask my mother to pray for the sermon tonight, please. see us as we really are. There's nothing hidden from your eyes. And we thank you for your mercy and your love. Would you touch Michael tonight and anoint him, Lord, and use him. Give us open ears and open hearts and obedient hearts. Whatever you want to talk to us about, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. According to John Mott, Arthur T. Pearson, A Presbyterian minister was the one who was responsible for sounding the trumpet that would start what was become known as the Student Volunteer Movement and Missions nearly 150 years ago. It was in 1882 that Pearson wrote in the Missionary Review that three things were needed to finish the Great Commission and evangelize the world. I I actually thought of taking these three things and making them points and varying sermons for this revival because, listen, this is good. Three things that are needed to finish the Great Commission and evangelize the world. Number one, the whole church needed to be involved. Brother Davis? 
I thought I'd hear at least two amens here. I'll say it again. One, the whole church needed to be involved. (laughs) Number two, evangelistic zeal was needed in the lives of the believers. And number three, a baptism of the power of the Holy Spirit was needed. On this last point, this is what he wrote. To do this work in 20 years, we must get more gospel, more vitality. The church has money, brains, organizations, rivers of prayer, and oceans of sermons, but she lacks in power. Wow. Wow. In 1891, when the first international convention of the student volunteer movement gathered in Cleveland, Ohio, Pearson's friend by the name of A.J. Gordon gave the keynote address and entitled it, The Holy Spirit in Missions. He said this, Now, dear friends, all missionary success at home or abroad depends upon the Holy Ghost. I say it deliberately, the personal preparation of the Holy Spirit is the greatest need in our ministry in this country and in foreign fields. Here we are in 2024, 150 years later, and yet I believe the words of Pearson and Gordon need to be sounded again. The great need of this hour is power. A special power from the Holy Spirit for expanding the witness of Christ. This evening I want to look at the necessity of a double portion of the Holy Spirit. In our scripture reading tonight, we have the story, the very familiar story that all of you know of how God took Elijah to heaven in a chariot of fire. Here we have what I believe to be an excellent typology of being filled with the Holy Spirit or a double portion of the Spirit of God. Elisha had a need which I believe is representative of our need. Elisha was Elijah's student. I imagine that he had heard the stories of all the miracles of Elijah. Perhaps, maybe even Elisha was present. We don't necessarily know that for sure, one way or the other. But maybe he was there with Elijah for some of the miracles. He had definitely heard the stories. He had heard the stories how Elijah prayed, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. You can find that in 1 Kings 17 and verse 1. And how he had prayed and the widow's son was raised from the dead in chapter 17 and verse 22. And how he prayed and fire fell from heaven in chapter 18 and verse 38. And as before, he had prayed again and it didn't rain, but he prayed this time. And now it rained in chapter 18, verse 45. You see, in the middle of all of these things, all of these stories, Elisha recognized that he had a need. What was his need? Elisha was powerless, and he knew it. Elisha didn't have any power. I look at you tonight and I say, how many people are sitting within our churches, yea, even within our holiness churches, and I'm not reflecting on this pulpit or these ministers, but I'm going to say it anyways, even within our pulpits, within our ministries, in the homes of our parsonages, in leadership, and are powerless. And yea, maybe even recognize it. I want you to look at Elisha's request. We can see it in verse 9. By the way, if you didn't pick it up last night, I'm going to repeat it. I'm the kind of preacher that you probably want to keep your Bible open and follow along, because if you don't, you might be lost or bored. All right? Maybe you don't like that, but I'm kind of ADHD. All right? If I don't have something to look at, sorry, I'm going to find something else. 
and, and I, I have to have something in front of me to look at to keep my attention. So hopefully this will keep your attention. Follow along. Verse 9 of the chapter that we just read, I pray that a double portion of your spirit be upon me. What is he saying? Oh, Elijah, I can see the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, and I need that. Please let me have a double portion of the power of the Holy Spirit that is your life, that is in your life. However, I want you to notice that there were obstacles to receiving the blessing. I see that Elisha recognized his need, but he also resisted the obstacles. I always find this interesting. I know this is a familiar story that we all know. And we can kind of sit here and be bored. But maybe there's something that God wants to teach us here tonight. I don't know. I read this story and it always kind of stuns me. And maybe we can have a discussion, Brother McMillan, Brother Davis, Brother McDowell. I don't care. Brother, Brother Wilson's not here tonight. I'd love to discuss this because this is interesting to me. You see, number one, he resisted his own leader. That's fascinating. Three times Elijah said, stay here now. Now, was this a disobedience or was this a test? of Elijah. I don't know. I somewhat maybe think it was the latter, probably. But boy, oh boy, we see this in verse 2. You can see it in verse 4. You can see it in verse 6. But does Elisha listen to him? Oh no! He resisted his own leader. Why? Because the desire to receive the blessing of a double portion of Elijah's, of Elijah's spirit was so strong that nothing or no one could hinder him. He didn't only resist his own leader, but secondly, he resisted his friends. This is a good one. You see, how many friends, companions, Bible school, college friends sit around and go, oh, you're all right. Come on. What are you doing? You can see this in verse 3. You can see it in verse 5. These were literally his companions from Bible college. Other prophets who were studying in the same school. And they're trying to convince him not to go. Hey, look, can't you see that the Lord's going to come and take him away? Let him alone. What's his response? Yes, I can see it, but stop bothering me. You're not going to hinder me from being with him. Interesting. He not only resisted his own leader and he resisted his friends, but in all of this, I believe, and no, we don't have this in Scripture, but I believe this is clear, he resisted the enemy. Because the enemy didn't want him to receive the blessing. My brothers and my sisters, if you can see your need, I promise you that obstacles and hindrances will come to keep you from obtaining the blessing. I don't know where those obstacles will come from. Who knows? Maybe even a leader in your life. Maybe your dad. Maybe your mom. A husband. A wife. A grandfather. A grandmother. Maybe it'll be a friend or a co-worker. The enemy is going to try to hinder you so that you do not obtain the blessing of a double portion of the Holy Spirit. Oh, that God may show us the need give us a hunger, and give us a hunger that's so strong that nothing and no one will be able to stand in the way of us obtaining the blessing. For you see, when we recognize the need and we really become hungry for God to do a work, it's then that we're really willing to push through the obstacles and then when we'll see God work. Numbers of years ago in a long, far off place. Now remember, I have been, I, I can't hardly believe this. Today I was thinking about this. It's been 24 years of ministry in six different churches in two different countries. Wow. Um, so this story is kind of an interesting one. I remember somebody had gotten saved and was following God and we were having discipleship and God was moving. And I remember a particular fella that came to me and he was telling me all of his struggles and all of the things. And we began talking about this, the need for 
the filling of the Holy Spirit. And I remember this gentleman began to seek after God. Hard seeking after God. He looked at me and he said, Hermano Miguel. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. What do I need to do? What if I would begin to fast? Would that help? Oh, it's going to (laughs) help. Why? How hungry are you? He began to fast. Remember, I met with him on one day, and he began to fast, and he was fasting a whole week. I remember we came together for a discipleship class, and he, we had that class, and after that class, he looked at me and he said, well, God is helping me. God is really, really helping me. I said, have you received the blessing yet? No, not yet, but he's helping me. Now, pastor, listen. Could I stay here and pray tonight? This is a hard-working guy. A really hard-working guy. I knew he hadn't eaten probably in a week. Now he's going to stay there all night long with no sleep. I said, listen, you're not going to do this by yourself. He goes, no, no, that's not what I'm asking. Can you just keep the door open so that I can be here? And I'll let you know when I leave so you can come and lock it. I said, oh no, you're not staying here by yourself. If you're going to stay here and pray, I'm going to stay here with you. Because God wants to meet your need. You see, we have somebody that recognized the need, was pushing through the obstacles, and was really hungry. How hungry are we? Really, how hungry are we? We sang a song tonight. I'm hungry for a fresh touch. I'm hungry for a new wave of glory. How hungry are you? I think sometimes we prove it by, yes, our lackadaisicalness, our laziness, our not really being willing to stick at the job. And it's kind of like the disciples and Jesus, right? Could you not pray just a little bit? without going to sleep? He was hungry. (laughs) I'll never forget it because we started off about 9.30 and we started praying together and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and the time passed and boy, let me tell you something, when that happens, the devil begins to fight. Big time. And I'm telling you, the devil was all over that place. But as we began to plead the blood and plead the blood and plead the blood, he began to plow through. You could feel it. And long about 2.30 in the morning, I'll never forget it. He was right up here on the front left side. He jumped up and shouted at the top of his lungs, well, hallelujah, it's done. It's over. And he began running and shouting and running and shouting and running and shouting. I said, listen, you said you wanted to stay all night. Oh, no. He looked at me. He says, we're done. I said, are you sure? Oh, there's no question. God's done the work. There's no reason to stay on. He's done it, Pastor Mason. He's done it. I'm here to tell you from that day forward, he was a changed man. He had received the double portion of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he recognized his need. He was hungry for it. And he pushed through the obstacles. I see Elisha recognized his need. He resisted the obstacles. And because of it, we read it. You can look at it through verse 11. Through 15, we see that he received the blessing. And I'm here to tell you, I want you to notice that not only did Elisha receive the blessing, but those around him, they also recognized there was a difference. Look at verse 15. They knew that Elisha had received the blessing. When the sons of the prophets, which were there to view at Jericho, saw him, what did they say? The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And wow, if you read the rest of the story, we don't have time to do it tonight, but boy, did he receive a double portion. Because all of us, we think of Elijah as that great prophet, and he was the one who who had the battle with the, the prophets of Baal, calling down fire from heaven. But folks, Elisha, what a ministry powerful ministry of healing and raising people from the dead and doing all sorts of miracles. 
Elisha received the blessing. I want us tonight to not only see the need for the double portion there in the Old Testament, but I want us to look to the New Testament. There are several things that I'd like us to look out of the New Testament. First of all, I want to take a look at the disciples, and I want to look at them before the day of Pentecost. This is an interesting study because first I see the disciples were carnal. They were full of pride. They were full of selfishness. All you have to do is read Mark chapter 9 or Luke chapter 22. Turn with me to Mark chapter 9 and verses 33 and 34. And you're going to see... Here are the disciples disputing over who among them would be the greatest. Now, can you imagine? Now, who among us, who who of us is going to be the greatest, Jesus? It's going to be me, isn't it? No, it's going to be me. Oh, it's going to be me. What are you guys talking about? No, not in those terms, but boy, oh boy, does it sound like some of our churches that I'm aware of. What's the problem? The disciples are carnal. They're full of selfishness. They're full of pride. All the disciples wanted to be was the greatest. They wanted to be the boss. If I'm not the one doing it, then I'm not going to do it at all. Woo! Smile at me. Are, are, are we all all right? We all, are, we, are we all hanging in there? Okay, good. Brother McMillan's smiling at me. I, I feel better. We know there's something in all of us called the sinful nature, don't we? It's amazing that you don't have to teach kids to say, no, you can't have this car. It's mine. Or, but daddy, I had it first. How many of you had to teach your kids to say those things? Anybody at all? Yeah, I didn't think so. How many of your children, how many of you would be willing to raise a hand and go, yeah, my children have said things like that or similar to that? (laughs) Yeah, me too. What is it? It's the sinful nature, the selfishness in us that says, I'm the greatest of all. I'm the first. I must have the biggest piece of dessert. I, I, I. And this is the same attitude of the disciples that we find in these passages. They're fighting over who is the greatest. And in Mark chapter 10, they're fighting over who will sit on his right hand and on his left side. See, they weren't just carnal, though. They were also powerless. You can see this in Mark chapter 9. You can look at verses 28 and 29. Here we find the story of the disciples and the boy possessed by a demon. A a man brings his child to them. And the child begins foaming at the mouth and gnashing his teeth. And the disciples tried to cast out the demon. I don't, I don't know. Sometimes we don't know what all happened. But in my imagination, I have a pretty big one. And I like to think about this kind of thing. And somehow with the other things that we just got done talking about, I can see the disciples arguing over who's going to cast out that demon. I should do it. I'm the oldest disciple. No, I should do it. I was the first one who was called. Folks, there were problems. Big time problems. What happened? I don't know. I don't know what for sure happened except that we know they couldn't cast out the demon. Jesus said some of those things only happened through prayer and fasting. We talked about prayer last night. They were powerless. They were carnal, they were full of pride, they were full of selfishness, they were powerless, but also they were weak. I see that they were weak in their testimony. You see, it's interesting to me that there's no place in all of the Gospels where you can read that the disciples shared and many believed in Jesus. Why is this? 
I believe it's because the disciples were weak in their testimony. I think it's possible that the disciples were trying, attempting to give their testimony. And actually, we see Jesus sending them out two by two. Jesus had changed their lives. He had done something for them. He sends them out two by two. But there's no place in which we read any kind of story where many came to follow Jesus because of the disciples throughout the Gospels. Why? I believe they were weak in their testimony. We already heard that they were weak in their prayers. Jesus admitted it. You can't do this because this only comes about by prayer and fasting. We also know they were weak in their resistance. We're coming up. This is Holy Week. Fascinating to me, at the Lord's Supper, there sits Peter all high and mighty. I'll never deny you. I'll go with you to the very end. Who will it be? Not me. And in just a few short hours, all of those disciples would be running with their tails tucked between their legs, scared to death. Not just running, but Peter would not be able to resist the temptation and we know he would deny Jesus three times. But ladies and gentlemen, the disciples before Pentecost, we see them, but I also see the promise of power. Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Jesus says, and behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Acts chapter one, verse eight, again, the works of the words of Jesus, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth last I see the disciples filled with power Acts chapter 2 begins and when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared upon them cloven tongues like as a fire and it sat upon each of them here it is verse 4 and they were all filled with the holy ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance ladies and gentlemen after the day of pentecost what a fantastic contrast we find. Those who were previously fighting, those who were previously struggling over who's the greatest, who's the best, who should do this, who should do that. Now we find they're united. We just read it. Those who were previously powerless are now filled with power. Those who had a weak testimony before are full of power in their testimony. You can look at it in verse 41 of chapter 2. Now they're full of power in their prayers. We talked about one of them in chapter 4 in verses 31 and 32 of Acts. But there are many examples. Acts chapter 5 and onward. They were full of power to perform miracles. Many, many miracles. They cast out demons. They healed many. Those who were powerless in their resistance, now they're strong in the midst of persecution. Isn't this stunning? Those who previously ran away in the midst of problems, now in the midst of problems, trials, battles, struggles, and persecutions, they remain strong, even in prison. And in the middle of prison, they have the power to continue praising and worshiping and singing to God. What a stark contrast. Brothers and sisters, we see this great difference between the disciples before the day of Pentecost and after. What's the difference? It's the power of the Holy Spirit. In both cases, in the Old Testament and the New, what we see is that makes the difference is the power of the Holy Spirit. It was James Hudson Taylor, the pioneering missionary who opened inland China to the gospel. He had a remarkable experience with God, where I believe he received the double portion of the Holy Spirit. 
that brought newfound peace and unsurpassed joy to his ministry. On the outside, Taylor may have appeared to be a pillar of strength, but inwardly, the pressures and the demands of a growing ministry and ministry responsibilities were taking their toll. Taylor had trusted God for 24 fellow workers to open up the interior of China. But as the new workers entered the field, threats began to multiply. Those were days when scarcely a station in China was opened without danger to life itself. Riots were so usual that they seemed almost part of the proceedings. As his burdens increased, Hudson penned this in a letter to his mother. At times, I seem almost overwhelmed with the internal and external trials connected with our work. I cannot tell you how I am buffeted sometimes by temptation. I never knew how bad a heart I had. Each day brought its register of sin and failure, of lack and power, he wrote to his sister. Must it be thus the end, constant conflict and too often defeat? He continues writing, instead of growing stronger, I seem to be getting weaker and to have less power against sin, he confesses. I hate myself, I hate my sin, yet gain no strength against it. The more he strove after holiness, the more it seemed to elude his grasp. As he considered the grace lavished upon him by Jesus, Taylor's guilt and helplessness increased. He says this, Unbelief was I felt the damning sin of the world, yet I indulged in it. I prayed for faith, but it came not. What was I to do? But then... 15 years after he first set his foot in China, God would reach down and touch Hudson Taylor's heart in such a powerful way that it would change the course of his future ministry. God would do a transformative work through the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of Hudson Taylor. It would be, as some would call it, a revival of the heart, a second blessing, a baptism of the Holy Spirit, or a double portion of the Spirit of God. No matter what it is called, God did it all in His way and in His timing. The difference in Taylor's life as a result of this experience was evident to everyone around him. Missionary Charles Henry Judd records the the remarkable change. He says this, He was a joyous man now, a bright, happy Christian. He had been toiling, burdened one before, with latterly not much rest of a soul. Whenever he spoke in meetings after that, a new power seemed to flow from him. And in the practical things of life, a new peace possessed him. Troubles didn't seem to worry him as before. He cast everything on God in a new way and gave more time to prayer. I'd like to know tonight, I felt God burdening me with this message and honestly, I didn't fully understand it. If I were to choose a message for tonight, I don't think I would have chosen this one. But God knows what we need. My question tonight is, Crystal comes to the piano and we bow our heads and close our eyes. Maybe there's someone here and you say, I have a hunger. I'm hungering for the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe there's someone here and you say, Brother Mason, I'm hungry tonight to be filled with the Holy Ghost. What are the requirements? Number one, I believe you must be saved. Number two, you have to recognize the need for it. Number three, you have to ask God who freely gives us whatever we ask for. I honestly don't believe that has to be a struggle. I really don't believe that. God wants to give it as much as we want to receive it. Want us come, is there anyone else? Let's stand together reverently, quietly.
God is here tonight. He's speaking. There's not a one of us here that has to go a moment later, a moment more, lacking the power from that comes from the Holy Spirit. He waits, willingly, waiting, wanting to give it to us. He says, if you being evil know how to give gifts to your children, <laughs> how much more does your heavenly Father want to give to them that ask? <laughs> He's here tonight. He's here to meet your need. Thank God for it. Anyone else? We're just waiting a little bit longer here tonight. Thank you. Let's gather. Let's pray with these. These have come recognizing their need, hungry for God, saying to God, God, you've promised in your word. You've told us you would do it. Now I come in faith and trust believing. Praise God. Jesus, fill her with power from on high. 
to your children <laughs> and to those that would come after. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for the promise. The promise of the
Let's sing that chorus together that she's playing. Fill my cup, Lord. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it. cup can be full tonight. It can be a reality. And I'm thankful for that tonight. And maybe somebody real quick, someone that's come to the altar and God's spoken to you or helped you tonight and you just want to stand and declare what, what he's done in your life or how he's met your need. The Bible says we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And if you feel like you need to testify tonight, Give you some time for that. Anybody need to give God praise or declare where they're at tonight? Well, I thank God. I didn't go to the altar tonight, but I was sitting in my seat here, and I was just thinking, um, he's like, you just need to pray. You just need to say, I need, need to fill, and I, I'll grant it to you. Just ask it. And so I asked tonight, and he granted me the filling of the Holy Spirit. And I praise God. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Anyone else? Oh, it's overflowing with joy. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Sixty four in the, the chorus book. If we could play that one and sing that one. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Let's sing this chorus. Teachers, and I'm just praying that the Lord um, 
fills me and uses me. Amen. 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 And as a church, let's be praying for Miss Julia and that burden on her heart and be lifting her up before God, trusting God to use her however he would see fit. Anyone else? All right. Well, if every heart's clear, I'm going to ask if you would, let's stand together. And uh, we thank the Lord for his presence. And if, if not for anyone else, I'm thankful for how he came and he spoke to me and gave me a fresh touch. And I need that from time to time, even as a preacher yes. or as a pastor. And sometimes I just need God to come and move in my heart and touch me again, fresh and anew. And we thank the Lord for how he's moved among us tonight and trusting him to continue to help us throughout the remainder of this revival. I trust that each and every one of you will come back and uh, continue to pray. We thank the Lord for how he met with us last night and tonight, and we're just trusting in him to meet with us throughout the remainder of this revival. Amen? Amen. We want him to do whatever he wants. We want him to have right away in this revival. And if he speaks to you, I trust that you'll respond. Thank you to those that have been obedient and have been responding. And we're just trusting God through, through the remainder of this revival. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for who you are. Lord, we're thankful for your presence that we felt in a real way tonight, Lord. And the fresh touch that you can give and the filling of the Holy Ghost that you can give. And Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to not stop short but to seek after your filling and, and know that it can be found, Lord. And I pray that you would go with us tonight, that you would touch each heart, strengthen, go with them throughout the day tomorrow and bring us back tomorrow night. Lord, we're trusting and relying on your strength and your power. Lord, we thank you for your presence here tonight. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming. You are dismissed.